Jazz, the show that is more like Balderdash than a podcast. I'm your host, one of your hosts, Chris, Jazz Sequence on the Internet. I am joined, as always, by Gary, who is Binary Gary on the Internet and is also a uh, trainer of, uh, he's a falconer, uh, amateur and professional and regional. Um, and also Allison, who is Allison Plus on the internet, who uh, is the manufactress of a uh, a shop on Etsy uh, that produces small beds for Burmese cats. They're super comfy. <laughs> Come and check us out. Yes. <laughs> It's Burmese cats on Etsy dot Etsy dot com dot net dot or co. Gary's currently checking to see if that domain is <laughs> available. And I just registered a new domain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Viral traffic. Um, I um, I'm excited to see you all. I have to share a wacky dream I had with you. Um, the dream I, uh, was with us. Please do, Gary. <laughs> I wasn't with you in the dream. I had a wacky dream that I would like to share with you. Was it the proper amount of pause between, before they're with you? I hope so. I, um, I was watching golf on this past Sunday while my um, infant daughter slept on my chest. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm not like a huge golfer. I just happened to be the thing that I wanted to watch on Sunday, the rare Sunday afternoon I had the TV on. Um, so this dream last night that there was a green which is like where the pin is with the hole. Um, but it was only like four inches with this little green, it's tiny, surrounded by this like entire huge sand trap. So it would be nigh impossible to land the ball on the green. I'm not sure what the point of it was, um, but I was totally fascinated in my dream with it as I kept like circling to try and understand how one could potentially put a golf ball in this hole on the screen. Um, there's probably all sorts of metaphors and stuff of that nature. I just think it was funny and interesting and i was imagining like many golfers standing in the sand hitting and sand flying everywhere and totally missing the green and having to hit from the sand over and over and over so that was my uh wacky dream i would draw a picture of it if i could but that'd be a, it's par nine. a podcast I, I i mean i don't it would, it would even be possible i can't imagine i mean it would just be it would be dumb luck you know dumb luck you would uh you would land your ball on the green either in the hole or close enough that it would not roll off. I mean, how, would you, how would you do that? It would be nigh impossible, as I said. I thought a lot about it. I, not a lot. Just, <laughs> just it was, it, I, was, I was entertained in my dream. I mean, it was like in the dream I was, that's cool. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are. Here we the are. Of life. Was that an appropriate amount of stalling, Allison? It will do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm semi semi pleased and semi just all over the place. Okay, so this might be a bit scattered, but bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> Such is life. Um, to continue with the less of a defined and more of a, a puzzle trend. Um, interactive fiction and gaming, at what point how much interaction is needed for something to be a game? Does that make sense? Yeah. I feel like you'll both have opinions. <laughs> and how much is like if it's just a simulation versus just like a walking simulator? A walking simulator? Well, yeah, like a... <laughs> that sounds terribly boring. <laughs> just get on that treadmill and keep on walking. <laughs> <laughs> it's like our metaphors walking. today are terrible <laughs> but Jeez. it's not actual walking you think <laughs> you're walking on a treadmill but you're not without any of the benefits of a treadmill 
But basically, yeah, is, basically, like, what, what, at what point does it transform into a game where you're like that form of interaction versus just a simulation? Okay, so the first thing that I think of when I think of interactive fiction is choose your own adventure. Yes. Yeah. And that is not a game. It is game like, but it is not a game. It's not a game for me because. I am not, I mean, I'm making choices. Because <laughs> I take it seriously. <laughs> I do too. Dude. Sorry, I'm very, on. I'm very serious about my gaming. Um, it's, <laughs> and your uh, adventures. Yes. And choose your own adventure. I, I, had, I had tons of them as a kid. Um, mm. And it's, it's game-like in that you're making choices that determine the outcome of the story, but the story is already written. Um, similarly, I think that there are video games that follow a choose your, follow a choose your own adventure like narrative, which are generally less fun because you don't get to control, you don't get to determine the outcome. You're just you're following along this path with like a few like pivot points that you know determine you know if I go down this fork or go down this fork or whatever. Um, so I would say that that's the least interaction so you want the free range versus like you're given three options and each one of those branch to yeah but that's there's a double-edged sword there too because if you do too much if, it, if it's too open if all if all a game is is just like an open world for you to do whatever um with nothing to tie things together then that's not fun either um that's like um second life yeah, right. I mean, there's like there's lot there's lots of things. I, I was thinking of a game that that was a, I think a Kickstarter a while back, um, which has a really interesting thing. I might have talked about it on the podcast before. Um, I might have just talked about it before. Um, called Code Spells, where uh, you the point of the game is it's it's one of those things that uh, that encourages coding. Um, so you it's got like this scratch like interface for for building spells like that you can use in the game. So like you can, I don't know, make, make, you're given a couple like based sort of template spells that your character can cast and then um, you can write your own spells and that's the cool thing. Um, but when I last played it and it was still in development and it might be better now, but when I played it, that's literally all there was. You're a wizard, you can write spells, it affects your environment, but there's nothing to interact with. So like, yeah, I can build a lake right here and that's cool. Okay, you can build a crater and then fill it with water and then set the water on fire or whatever, but there's nothing to interact with. It's just like, boop, that's, that's a cool thing. Mm -hmm. I am what the industry would call a uh, casual gamer. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not really like hip with what's like current and exciting. And if, if, if somebody spent some money on Amazon advertising and it caught my attention, I'd probably, you know, like, I'd, oh, that looks like a neat game and it maybe you know, an outdated idea and yada, yada, yada. So I'm not, I'm certainly not as, um, as uh, regimented in my beliefs as far as what qualifies as a game. I think, um, I don't know, like kids all the time, like, you know, do you want to play a game with me? What do you want to play? Let's, let's play um, like Lego Star Wars. Like not like an actual game, but like here are some Lego characters. Like it's, it's not a game. We're inventing a world and, you know, I, don't know, I feel like it's necessary of language correction at that point, but the concept of game, like, you know, the broader, the broader idea that children often have, I think is my, for me, I'm happy with that definition. My kids are constantly playing various iterations of what's essentially just live action role playing. Um, but yeah. it's like, it's gone through various uh, iterations. It started off being called a uh, real Ninjago where they were playing characters from the Lego Ninjago series. And then that mm -hmm. evolved to uh, real Minecraft or maybe Minecraft Live. I'm not sure what they called it, but same idea, except now they're in Minecraft world. And that's evolved into uh, something else. But it's often informed, even when it is within these sort of contexts, it's often informed by other pieces of media. So like we read audiobooks. And there's a particular series, uh, the uh, Frontier Magic series, which is really, really good. Allison, you should check it out. Um, it down. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically the Old West 
if the, there is magic. Um, so it's all about like westward expansion in the early United States uh, with magic and um, and magical creatures and things. And there are different schools of magic um, that represent various you know types of magic that came from different parts of the world. And the Evrupan magic is what most Americans, except they're not Americans, they're Colombians because it's the United States of Colombia. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because most of us immigrated from Europe, that's what we, and it's all like weird names because they, they're based on things. And, and so, but there's diff different schools and they come from different places and there's, there's arguments about which is better and whatever. So anyway, where I'm going with this is the kids will bring those magical schools into their storytelling. Um, they also had, there was, a, there was a period of time after we watched uh, uh, the Miyazaki movie Nausicaa where they would bring in uh, things they bring in Nausicaa the character, but also like things from that movie uh, would would make appearances in their storytelling, and it's just it's it's always been really sort of fascinating what things kind of stick, um, and and how they explore those those things. The um yeah, I find like mine like it's it's other media informs the gameplay, but but real world experiences and. Like interactions with other other children make their way into you know, ten play. Um, I kind of want to go the other direction though, um, entirely. Like thinking about um, like walking simulation simulations in general, right? Um, like, um, what was the one you uh, ran on DOS? Lemonade Tycoon? It wasn't Lemonade. Mm. Tycoon. Lemonade Stand. Lemonade Stand. Right. Yeah, I was actually yeah. looking at that not that long ago. Yeah, so in that case, like, is that, is that a game? Because the only element of randomness is, like, the weather and the cost of produce, right? You're really, like, it's really, you know, business management um, wrapped in a, a funny story. And that, that narrative obviously still exists plentifully across uh, pocket games for, you know, mobile devices. Um, and I, always, I, find, I find those pretty, uh, pretty enticing. Like, one of my, one of my favorite... Um, uh, game studios out there is one called Nimblebit, and their games are not challenging. They do like Tiny Tower, and there's several takes on Tiny Tower, like Tiny Tower Vegas, and the, they partnered with Dis uh, Lucasfilm before Disney bought it, maybe, and did Tiny Tower Star Wars, and they've done um, Pocket Planes, where you, you know, build a network of, or build an airline network across the world, and and they're 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 not challenging because there's always constant growth, like you can't quote unquote lose, right? Um, I feel like this is where we should cut to a sponsorship room. <laughs> and now we're from our sponsor. You can't lose with. <laughs> I, well, and I guess like, I guess what I'm headed with that though is like, what's the purpose? Like, what is, like, you know, what is, what is the purpose of gaming? Like when I'm playing a game like that, it's often recently, it's often been in the middle of the night and I'm, you know, shuffling around the house carrying an infant that's nearly asleep, but I am not, you know, and it's a one handed game and there's not, much thought or logic that goes into it and um it's not littered with advertisements and it's just you know pleasing visuals um, but it's it's borderline on being a, a game based on our, our current definitions because there's not you know not a lot happening whereas you know lemonade stand i don't know i mean so I, don't, I don't think winning or losing necessarily needs to be a criteria of whether or not a thing is a game um there's I mean, I can go down the the role playing game uh, wormhole, and and like that role playing is a game. It's a thing that you do. There's no winning or losing unless you consider your character dying being a loss. But then you just make a new character and you keep going. Um, there's no winning because I mean, yes, you accomplish things and maybe you gain fame, notoriety, experience, whatever. But there's not a, a completion point. Uh, other than one dictated by the whoever is running the game, the dungeon master or whatever, um, just saying, okay, we're done. But it's not like you win. Congratulations, here's your prize. But it also goes into that thing of like, what's more impactful? Is it media as escapism, or is it like that relatable kind of narrative journey? Maybe because like there are times when I just want to tap a thing and stare at a wall and that's great <laughs> and it's t still a game but then there are other times when I'm like 
I'll be just totally immersed in a story of some sort. And that's a lot more important at that point. Well, I think, yeah. And, and so games, I mean, obviously there are, there are solo and multiplayer games. And I think some of that escapism, right? Like some of that, some of the fun of escapism is doing it with other people, you know? Um, and there's, there's certain, there's certain games that the game itself does not have a lot of value. Like, like there's this, there's this game I used to play with my uncle and it was called, Ooh, what was it called? I don't know what it's called. Um, but you ran, like, effectively, you, you ran a, a railroad. Um, and there was an east side of the board and a west side of the board. And, and the game wasn't very well written because if you were the east side, you had to go up the mountain and you ended up catching a lot of demerits because you were always late because you got stuck behind a freight train moving slowly. So, I mean, like, the way to win the game was, like, sit down on the west side. Like, that was how you won. And, and we, we knew that. And we expect, accepted that for years. Um, yet we still played the game because the conversation was – was good and entertaining and we made silly jokes and you know it was like a comfortable spot to lose reality for a bit and and be i don't know train dispatchers it was called dispatcher Dispatcher. Yeah. by avalon hill i think to go back to the original question is at what point does uh interactive fiction become a game i think it comes down to the amount of of choice that you have um, you have to be able like, there's a certain breaking point after which, okay, now it's a game. Like the choose your own adventure stories were not, were not games. Things that are, but, but I mean, I guess at the converse is there are things that are currently defined as games now that are, are don't even fit that criteria, uh, which means that I'm an asshole to those game developers probably, um, <laughs> because I don't think that they're games, um, apparently, um, it's okay, our listener. Our one listener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a, that's a sidebar. This is a great way to avoid, like, angry email, is to have a listener. You know? I'm the, I'm the listener, so if you haven't received an email I know. from me. That's my point. Like, you haven't go. sent, like, a nasty email yet. Like, you jerk, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I can't believe that you derided my whole industry. Um. You know, I, I I previously thought of myself like as not a gamer, and I even said that earlier. So, but I, the more I the more I think about it, maybe I maybe I am like that casual gamer that the industry likes because I do spend money on games, and you know, I don't know. Um, I uh, I definitely um, um, think of people that are majorly into board games. Like I think of that as like a a nerd subculture, right? Like, I say that like in a respectful way, but I mean it's like a subculture, you know. Um, <laughs> And uh, I mean, Chris, it's, it's, it's awesome. But, and I, and we've had like long gaming conversations in our, our Slack and I've, I have looked at and um, added items to my wish list based on our conversations. And I don't know, like thinking more about gameplay mechanics and that kind of stuff. And um, you know, there's, I don't know, there's, there's something to that exercising your brain in that fun sort of way that, that is cool. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm definitely big on the loud boisterous community games they typically tend to be card games. Like that's, that's, that's my jam, you know? Um, but I can definitely see myself getting into more, I don't know, more, more, uh, those are generally shorter running games, you know, like 30 minutes or less. I could see myself getting into longer games with the right people, you know? Um, cause that social aspect I think is, is what makes it fun. When we pulled the kids out of school, uh, and started unschooling, um, which is probably a topic for another day. Uh, we knew, that much of the education the kids would be getting would be through games. I mean, we were already gamers and the kids had already shown interest in not just like casual board games, but like really detailed, like, dude, my son's been a fan of Catan since he was like eight. I mean, and, and that's the thing that he wants to do. And, and, more power to you. That's a really hard game to get behind. It's a really long game and it's kind of tough to say, yes, we'll play Catan because it takes so damn long. But um, every opportunity he has to, to pull out Catan is an opportunity that he will take. And, and so we've, we've, and that's, I mean, that's awesome. Um, and we've got, we've built a rather obscenely large collection of really uh, cerebral, like, um, games that are just sort of at the edge of what, I mean, 
we're we're beyond the point where um like the little age thing has like recommendation on games has any meaning whatsoever like we're we're far past that um and so we're like edging into like just further and further at the ed you know at the end of what would be uh something that they can they can handle and 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 yeah i mean we just push up those edges and and they you know come along we we pulled out um when we a few years ago i got a game called seven wonders and we we opened it up to play it that first day i got it for like christmas or something and we pulled it out to play it and we just tried playing it and it the rules just it didn't make sense to me and it didn't make sense to the kids and it was just okay we'll just we'll just put this away for a while and so we pulled that out recently because it's been a couple years i'm like yeah let's try this again and like that's the thing like that's that's our new that's our new uh, our new thing and it's it's interesting because like it was really really difficult to just get my wrap my head around the rules at the time or like how the thing progressed um and now it's like yeah this is i mean everybody's on board and we're playing it with with uh grandparents and the kids are helping explain how the thing works and yeah i mean it's do you, do you think like like having played two more years of of exceedingly more complex games it led to the yeah, I think I think that I mean, that, yeah, I mean, it's it's also like you know, every time we get something, we we look at like not just like the recommendation, but also like you know how like what we know of the game. We look at reviews and and sometimes we'll watch tabletop or whatever to see like how it actually plays out and and determine based on that whether we think this is like more or less complex because like sometimes sometimes they're off in either direction right sometimes they're yeah, yeah. way too oh 13 plus whatever and it's like well it's not that much different than this other thing that we play all the time um and so yeah i, I do think that playing that like putting it away for a while and then they come, and then playing other things and then coming back to it having had the context of other games during that two-year period or whatever it definitely made a difference um do you think that um uh, in the interest of totally not answering Allison's question, do you think that augmented reality um, is going to be like a major shift in the way we do tabletop gaming? You mean like um, what Apple wants us to think it is? Well, <laughs> right before we start this episode, <laughs> to directly not answer your question, right before this episode, um, I was uh, on some site and somebody had um, taken the old Nintendo game Street Fighter, right? But you can play it in augmented reality so you can have like street fighter played like in your backyard, right? Like 3d characters in your back. Okay. That's not really my grind. Like I'd probably be more into like the Ninja Turtles running around backyard, but <laughs> still like this is, that's pretty, the video kept me entertained for at least 30 seconds before I killed that website and went and did something else, you know, <laughs> squirrel. Um, so, I mean, so yeah, I guess that is a question. Like, like yeah, Apple's pushing it hard, but but it's uh, just Apple technology. Like it's it's going to be a thing. It's not the concept is not difficult, right? So you expect it to come to Android. Maybe I would just ignorant. I would love for augmented reality to be a thing that trickles down to board games. I don't think it will. I think that the audience of people who play board games like things that are tactile. That's part of the board game experience. And the audience of people who like games on their phone, like virtual. So the thing that makes augmented reality cool, in my opinion, is the fact that you've got this virtual world interacting with your real world, but you're not personally interacting with your real world. So it's not like there's going to be an augmented reality version of a board game of, of Catan where everybody's got their phones and you've got a board in the middle and everybody's looking at their phones to see the board. I don't think that's yeah. going to be a thing that happens. Will it mean that we can all get together and, and like that, that demo at the whatever Apple released last where they had like a table and then they were showing it and it's like this big war thing. And, you know, like, will there be things like that? Sure. But I don't consider that that's not like a tabletop game. That's, a, that's maybe a game that's on a tabletop, <laughs> but it's not, yeah. you know, it's not a board game. Um, and I don't think that's going to affect it's board a video game first. Yeah. I, I do think, I mean, augmented reality is, interesting but I, it hasn't been nearly as interesting as i have wanted it to be um i've played uh I've, so I've, i've played ingress and i played uh pokemon go uh and i'm anxiously looking forward to the uh the new niantic augmented reality game about harry potter where you're a wizard um 
because dude wizard um <laughs> because we all want to be a wizard <laughs> why would i not want to be a wizard i mean oh, man <laughs> what's the currency I could um, the hell out of that <laughs> what, what is the what is the what's the currency in the harry potter universe what do you mean? uh galleons oh, no, uh galleons and, for them. <laughs> and and nuts no am i thinking yes of the right? yes no you're not nuts K-N-T-S. i was like am, am i i was i was so wondering about getting son... mixed up in in lord of the rings somehow <laughs> no my son is reading harry potter right now for the first time and uh and he was <laughs> we're at dinner and he's like what are cunts <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. Where did where did you read that? And it was Harry Potter, and I I was immediately more relaxed. But there was a moment of sheer terror at the dinner table, and I, I couldn't figure out like where like what what media I had exposed him. To. Oh my God! What media had I, had I exposed to? Like what was going on? Until he showed it to me in Harry Potter. So I like that. Awesome. I, first of all, I like dinner table discussions at your house. <laughs> if they're at all related to Harry Potter, it's a good sign. But I like that you immediately sank into like a fear paranoia of like, what what did I expose him to media wise that brought this forward? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't. I won't, I won't say that we filter all media that he's exposed to. Well, that that would be a, an outlier of being like we should track down where this came from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Wait, but we are, what we are, Harry Potter book is he on? Um, just the first one right now, actually. Yeah. So he, so this is like a new experience because I, he wanted to read it because um, my sister, his aunt, was like, "Oh, I, I bet you're ready for Harry Potter." So he's like, "Can I read Harry Potter? Can I read Harry Potter?" I'm like, "Sure." So I pull out the Kindle and I, I obviously have it on the Kindle, and I'm like, "Great, this is my Kindle, um, and this is how it works." And uh, uh, it's not like you're used to where you can like remember the, your page number because he doesn't want to dog your things. So he remembers the page number he's on because that's, that I would totally, I'd be like, I'd close the book and be like, oh man, was that 94 or 49? We're never going to know, you know? Uh, but he can, he can walk around all day with like 176 in his head and come back and open 176. Um, so, you know, we talked to the Kindle and stuff. So he, it's, it's fun to see like that interaction. And, and if he wants to, like, he likes to go back in books and recover ground, you know, and like, Make sure he understands. So in the Kindle, he's tapping furiously, and you know it's it's fun to watch. The audiobooks yeah. are also very good for Harry Potter if you're an audiobook person. Uh, there's voices involved. It probably depends on on which one. We found an audiobook recording uh, by a oh crap. I can't remember who it was, but it was good. Yeah. There's an actor that I knew whose name I have completely. It, it not David Attenborough, but it's some other British. It's it's a David Attenborough-ish yeah. person. Yeah, we'll go with that. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> when we figure out who it was, it will be like, in the show notes. <laughs> um, that's, yeah. Well, that's but there's other Harry Potter uh, uh, narrated. There's other narrators that are not as good because I think I got some of them. Um, that had that person and then some of them that didn't and it was better hmm. he um he just, he just has like such an appetite for the written word we get in the car to go somewhere and like that for him is is permission to open whatever he's reading and get to it and uh to the point where we get to where we're going and it's like you have to break into that bubble like get hey close your book get out of the car we're here um so and and sometimes i get frustrated with that and i need to remember like that's 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 pretty awesome that Yep. that he's that he has that relationship and um and then the other thing is i i don't remember who said it probably someone well-known and famous but i think i heard it from a friend that's an english teacher um that when you hear someone mispronounce a word um that's cool like it means they learned it in a book so mm-hmm. like i love that wow I like, that I love means that i'm thought. really cool <laughs> well i mean i, just, I love that thought process all the right? time <laughs> especially given the context of our last dinner conversation um but i, I love that context right like like if they're mispronouncing words, like they read it, like they didn't, it wasn't like something they heard or presented to them, right? Like they struggled with it. And there's, I don't know, I think there's, there's value in that. Like, you know, I don't know. Aaron well, always gets on me about like, saying Partesian. Partesian. <laughs> it's like Artesian, <laughs> except with parties. <laughs> oh, I like that a lot. <laughs> I, I, I prefer that. <laughs> but I do like, I, um, 
I grew up reading lots of like sci-fi fantasy and as a result, like, but not talking about it um, just because there was no one to like talk about it with, I guess, beyond a certain point. And so like names of characters and weird fantasy, mm. like high fantasy is a perfect example of that where it's like the Wheel of Time series. And then when I finally met someone <laughs> who had also read it and then we were just like, wait, you say it like this? And I'm just like, no, no, but in the index in the back, they show that you pronounce it like, <laughs> But it's like yeah. those things that, or like Hermione from Harry Potter. Sure. I feel like there was a huge law like debate on how to say her name. I, I read books to the kids uh, at night before bed. And um, yeah, names suck. I, <laughs> as well as words that I've never heard out loud, it, that also sucks. But names are just awful. And like, yeah, uh, I had a really hard time. We, we were going through... Um, it was the Aragon series uh, we finished a little while ago, and there's some names in there that's like, I, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like as long as you're consistent with the, the bad pronunciation, that's all that matters. So that they know it's the same character. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, to go back to your, to your point about the kids uh, getting sucked in a book, my daughter um, has started doing this thing where she can't go to sleep without reading uh, before bed and so used so for a long time she just we'd go to bed we'd say okay good night whatever we'd leave turn out the lights and and go downstairs and she would turn the lights back on or be reading with a flashlight uh like in her bed so we've we've compromised and said okay we'll do bedtime stuff and then you have 20 minutes and you can and we'll come back and we'll let you know and then it's time to actually go to bed so so that's her her nightly routine like we read and we read to both kids in both rooms and then we leave and we go downstairs and do something else for 20 minutes and then go upstairs okay time to go to bed lights out boom and um that has, has I wonder, worked. but it's it's the same sort of thing where it's like it's really hard to pull her out of a book i mean i want to know three things real quick one my blood pressure is rising as we reach the timer <laughs> two um you read underneath your covers as a kid with a flashlight, though, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Did you, yeah. So I hear, and the three thing, third thing is a story about that. Um, oh, no, the second thing was we have totally completed an episode without even remotely trying to answer the question. <laughs> nicely done. The third thing, oh, wait, so I when I was a kid. attempted. I didn't. I wasn't even close. <laughs> I, I didn't even participate in that part of the conversation. Uh, so nicely done. Thank you, Chris, for carrying the show today. Um, I, I, uh, I finished a book, uh, and I had bunk beds, and across from the ladder was my bookshelf but I knew that if I climbed down the ladder, I had to go past the door to get to the bookshelf. So like the length of the door and my parents were in the living room. So I tried to reach out from the bunk bed to put the book I'd finished back and grab another book. <laughs> and I fell um, and uh, feet like bang into the bookcase and I hit the ground and books are showering down on me and the bookcase <laughs> is rocking and spilling crap off the top of it. And I remember my dad standing like in the doorway and I'm on my back looking up at him and he's like, I just think it's time to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Not like, damn it, what the hell are you doing? Or are you okay? But I think it's time to go to bed. <laughs> that's, that's an excellent segue into, uh, into if we have any questions. Do we have questions today, Allison? We do. Excellent. Don't you think it's time to go to bed? <laughs> yes. Okay, so crosswalk timers. Oof. If there's a countdown already happening on that crosswalk and you're running late, do you, do you cross or do you, do you risk being late or do you risk your life? <laughs> <laughs> risk my life, uh, obviously. <laughs> yeah, this is, this question is tough. Like it depends on the city. Like there's a it lot does. to inform. This it decision. does because some, some cities like at the end of that crosswalk timer, like when it goes to the flashing hand, then yeah. the signal turns yellow then so that when the hand is solid, then it's a red light, but other cities, like it does the flashing hand, and then the hand stops flashing, and then the signal turns to yellow. And, and some cities, drivers are aware of crosswalks because there are so many pedestrians. And so, like in Jacksonville, like I barely walk in a crosswalk when it's green because, <laughs> I mean, people just get like, in a crank a right hand turn and cream me, you know? Um, right. In Atlanta, Georgia, totally. I mean, like it's, it's flashing, like that's still permission to get in, like to start. So uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, risk my life in Atlanta, but not in Jacksonville. <laughs> uh, have you ever met someone famous? and Or who is your favorite encounter if you've met more than one famous person? And famous could be a, a pretty broad. It could just be someone that's like admirable and well-known to you. 
Okay, so there's this one time I used to get a come. I used to get a uh, collect baseball cards, and this isn't like my favorite, but uh, this is a, just how much um, celebrities are assholes, really. Um, <laughs> sort of my favorite encounter, I guess. Um, uh, I used to go to collect baseball cards, and my dad and I would go to baseball card shows. And uh, one time we met Mark McGuire as he was like, uh, he because he was at the show signing autographs, and then he was leaving, and, and he had, they had a game that day. And so my dad says, you know, good game, or have a good game, Mark. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, the uh, another uh, Another asshole baseball player experience is uh, Orlando Cepeda. Uh, who was a pitcher for the San Francisco Giants a long time ago, uh, Hall of Famer. Uh, anyway, he was also signing autographs at my school, uh, which was a uh, Catholic school. And so they had this whole event that they were doing, and then he was there at the event signing autographs. And I had a, a Giants ball that I wanted him to sign, and he refused to sign my Giants ball because he had to sign balls that were being given at the thing that had some bank on them. <laughs> I, I can't think of any meaningful interactions with celebrities or anything of that nature. But I, I did as a kid go to a lot of spring training baseball games. So I'll just provide a counterpoint on baseball players. Spring <laughs> training is a totally different. That they're not all thing. assholes. <laughs> yeah. So like the, the, the Blue Jays did their spring training in Dunedin, which was like 30 minutes from my house. So we would, there were several times where we would skip school. My parents would take us out of school. We'd go to Dunedin Blue Jays uh, spring training game. Um, and uh, I remember the players were always just like so polite and they'd sign anything and they were happy to come and chat. And they always like, if there was a kid on the side, they would always come and, and chat with a kid and like, you know, keep practicing and one day you can play, you know, in the big leagues. And So wait um, here, the lesson though is that Canadian baseball players are nice. <laughs> you know, maybe that is the lesson, perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. Dunedin is, say- is a huge Canadian um, wintering city. I will say that that my interactions with with uh, Real Salt Lake soccer players have always been positive. Uh, there we go. Oh, here's a good one. A, a football player that uh, played in Jacksonville that was just cut from the team um, yesterday, actually, a guy named Alan Hearns. Um, we met him at some event at the stadium and uh, took a picture, Tyler and I, with him. And he was just a super stand-up dude. Um, and the quarterback for the Jags uh, and previous head coach um, spent some time with my uh, sister and uh, her family. Um, over over a couple years, um, so yeah, I, I guess sports people. Don't have to so all be up. Some people are garbage and some people are fine. Yeah, <laughs> that was. I kind of killed that, Chris. I should have just let you go with it, man. And now we're less than a minute, and I'm a total. Is there a third question that has like a one word answer? Not that I can fit in in less than a minute. These are quality. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and quality. with that, we will wrap up another episode of Binary Jazz. Ooh, we can't leave on that note. That's awful. Yeah, we can. Oh, yeah. No. We, yes, we can. You're like, you're like, I'm the guy who's editing the audio, so we're going to. <laughs> it's done. And now we're in extra innings, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You don't like my announcer voice. I, it's like I a touch little... Vincent Price. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit disconcerting. It made me uncomfortable. That, that's fair and, and also appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> you're like mission accomplished <laughs> um do you remember um cones of dunshire from parks and recreation oh you yeah the game yeah, that... i wanted to make a reference to that but i but you just I did there you yeah go. extra innings references yeah there it was Good game. this isn't less than a minute at all they're just liars no i know it, we, we were at two minutes and it went to less than a minute Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at at binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the form on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.